Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Propo. Join us as we dive into the world of education, certification, and technology. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Hannah Crapo. I'm the Content Marketing Manager at Certiport. And today we're talking about all things hands-on learning in the classroom, and we're so privileged to be learning from John Beale. John began his educational career working in museums, including the Spanish Colonial Quarter, the Florida Agricultural Museum, and the Florida Maritime Museum. After more than a decade in experiential education, he brought his experience to the classroom, first at middle school level teaching science and STEM marine science, before finding his place at Allen D. Neese High School in St. John's County, Florida teaching Introduction to Engineering and Design, Civil Engineering and Architecture, and Computer Integrated Manufacturing, and sponsoring the Transportation Technology Club with a focus on aerospace and electro- electrothons motorsports. He believes that industry certification creates a solid pathway to college careers and creativity, that collaboration and cooperation in and out of the classroom benefits all involved. And John is just an incredible educator. We're so excited to be learning here with him today. Before we dive in, John, I just wanted to give you a quick chance to introduce yourself. We gave your professional bio, but tell us a little bit about you. Um, So uh, without just echoing the whole professional bio (laughs) again, uh, I think probably the big big pieces for me is uh, I've worked in a lot of different fields, uh, mostly in education related to to technical knowledge, uh, but have always kind of focused on connecting people with information, making information easier to understand and sort of directing people towards ways that they can use that information for whatever projects they're interested. Mm -hmm. I love that. And so I think the concept of play and hands-on learning, you and I have talked about this for the podcast before. I know this is a subject that you're really passionate about. And I think that ties in really well with what you're saying, the proliferation of information and making sure people understand what's being taught. So why do you think it's so important to integrate play and hands-on learning in the classroom? So I I think integrating play into hands-on learning in the classroom is valuable because, so I think the first thing is to take kind of a half step back Mm. and look at, so the way I would define play in the classroom, I think there's a tendency to look at anything. It's only play in the classroom if it's clearly a game. Mm. And I think it's broader than that. I think anytime that you're you're using simulation or you're trying to replicate a real world condition, I, I think qualifies as play in the classroom. Anything that's not just a, okay, I'm going to stand here and read out of my textbook for 30 minutes and you're going to pretend like you're interested and engage with it. <laughs> um, anything that helps engage with the information is, is mm-hmm. valuable. One of my first mentors at the first museum I worked at always said that if you can get them to start learning before they realize they're learning anything, you've got half the battle right there. Mm-hmm. And I think play is a great way to do that. It's it's a way to disarm that initial um, resistance sometimes to like, yeah. well, I already know how to do this. I don't have to pay attention. And fortunately, I feel like at least in the CTE world, we don't have to deal with that as much necessarily as like yeah. in a core class where it's, well, when am I ever going to use this random algebraic equation? Well, mm-hmm. in engineering, if I'm giving you an algebraic equation, I'm telling you exactly <laughs> what we use it for. Yeah. Uh, so that that helps a little bit, but I still think it's valuable in, in creating that initial engagement, especially with somebody that teaches freshmen where they're coming from a middle school environment where mm-hmm. middle school STEM, which I also taught. So I've been, yeah no disparagement meant, but it's a different environment than high school engineering. And so getting them over that initial curve of this is, this is very different from that. Although there's Mm -hmm. a lot of the same core behind it. Mm -hmm. So I I think the, the big advantage to it is that it creates an environment where students can have more control in their learning Mm -hmm. and that control creates individual buy-in and that's key to getting them to listen to the more in-depth information. Yeah. And one thing when you and I have talked about this previously that you also mentioned, I thought was so interesting, is that play helps balance rigor with engagement, right? It's really easy to teach a rigorous course and make things incredibly difficult. But how do you balance that rigor of learning difficult subject matter 
with keeping students engaged. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that here as well. How do you find that that works out with hands-on learning? Yeah, I, I think that's a continual balancing act of finding mm-hmm. that place between rigor and between engagement, because just as easily as you can go, okay, well, we're going to make this, you know, it, it's all algebraic equations and it's all yeah. just the theory behind it. It's also just as easy to, to throw that all out and go, okay, well, here's, you know, Lego kits, go go play for an hour, Yeah, um, which there's value in that. But without any structure or framework or why behind mm-hmm. it, um, I think a lot of that value is lost. So it is. It's always a balancing act between rigor and engagement. Um, I, I think part of it also is that you can use, you can shift that even during the same project. You can, you know, if you've got something that's a, a very technical concept that you're trying to teach, starting mm-hmm. being heavier on the engagement side to get that initial buy-in and interest and then pushing back towards rigor now that you've got Mm. got the interest in it Mm -hmm. can be a really valuable technique. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about, and I see, I'm sure some of the examples that you've used for open-ended projects right behind you is starting with those kind of open-ended projects where students get really excited because it's very hands-on. So tell us about some of those that you've kind of used in the classroom. Absolutely. So for the freshmen, I tend to work with things that have a finite sort of mm. end point. Um, for the juniors, especially in the manufacturing class, we work a little bit more, and with civil engineering as well, we work with a little bit more of an open project where we sort of have a a very minimal design brief for it. Mm. Of, you know, It has to achieve these things. It has to incorporate mm. these pieces. But how you get there and what the end product is going to look like is going to be determined by the student or the group of students, depending on the project. Uh, And that's really valuable because again, it creates that, that buy-in because it's, then it's their project, even if Mm -hmm. it's your uh, sort of overarching plan. And that works just wonderfully for getting students involved and excited about things that otherwise might be a little dry. Yeah. Yeah. So in thinking about this, I'm sure there's a lot of subjects. I know engineering kind of gets a bad rap of being something that can be super dry. And you've been able to turn it around in your classroom and make it super fun and engaging. So what do you, what have you done and what do other educators need to do to make education a more playful experience, do you think? So I, th- I think there's, there's a couple approaches to it. Um, from, the, from the top down side, so to speak, from the teacher to the student side of things, one of the things to do is to pick projects that you as a teacher are excited about. Mm. Because if you're excited about it, you're going to be excited about it when you're talking to the students. And to some extent, that's, that's contagious. Um, And and that's really useful to to get that going, especially Mm -hmm. if you're, you know, late in the year and you just need that extra drive to keep going or whatever the case may be. Um, The other thing with that side of, you know, creating something that you're interested in, that you're passionate about is that where you're doing that project this year doesn't mean that you have to do that same project next year. Mm. You can always adapt it. Or if it doesn't work, you can completely shift and and go in another direction. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is sort of from bottom up from the student side of things is, you know, make sure that you're, so like I'm in a computer lab Mm -hmm. and a lot of what we do is software based because we do the auto AutoCAD, Autodesk Mm -hmm. um, certified user programs every every year for the whole four years of the academy. Um, but, you know, to make sure that you're, you're moving around the room, that you're listening to conversations because you can, you don't have to have the whole class necessarily engaged in it. But if you have an individual student that's really passionate about um, cars or aerospace or whatever, to make that connection to engineering, in my case, um, mm-hmm. it is a great way for, for, sort of creating that segue of, okay, so that's great. Let's talk about this for a minute or two and and connect it back to our curriculum Mm -hmm. and then sort of redirect back into whatever task is on hand. And it feels much more, um, much more positive. And I think has a better result in the classroom community than Mm -hmm. just the typical of like, okay, that's enough talking about this back to work, (laughs) Uh, which you know, you have to have to have that balance. There's something to be spend, said for that, yeah. Spend a few minutes <laughs> yeah. talking about cars as much as you might want to, but um, 
you know, using that as a, as a changeover, a, a loop back into whatever the recent lesson is, and then and then back to work. Mm-hmm. work well. Okay, I love that. So in thinking about these students, I love the idea of kind of getting a, a consistent pulse on what they're thinking and what they're excited about. As you've used play in the classroom, what have you found that your students have learned both from hard skills as well as like the soft skills side? Do you find that play is helpful for both of those? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the the hard skill side where where we've really seen a lot of benefit is so I've, the manufacturing class is relatively new, and I'm mm. we're still kind of working the yeah. working the details out. Um, but the civil engineering class I've been doing since I started here at Nice, so this is the fourth year. Mm-hmm. And one of the, one of the big overarching projects that I do that I definitely would consider kind of play in the classroom is is the students as a group vote for in each of the classes vote for a location and we basically create a development in that location. Mm. So they have to look at you know how is the climate going to affect it, how logistics wise of it. Somewhere we had one group one year that was way out in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, and so we had to have that discussion of like okay, so let's say that we do that how do we get all the building materials there? Mm. Um, which is a very, in that particular case, was a very challenging, <laughs> you know, having to start thinking through that yeah. because not only is it remote, but it's remote and the weather is not great. Not conducive. Yeah. So you have to time it. You had like, there's this whole extra mm. layer of things that we were able to get into. And so it was great to have this very real world conversation yeah. that if we were just going by the textbook, probably would have never came up, but is a mm-hmm. really good example of why logistics is important in any kind of an engineering industry and why you have to plan ahead and why you're not looking, you know, this today or this week or this month, but you're looking all the way to the end of the project and then mm-hmm. working back. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. So from a soft skills perspective, what have you, as students kind of progress through your curriculum, because you see them for multiple years, what do you feel like they kind of struggle with at the beginning as you're starting to use play with them. And then where do you find that they are kind of at the end? What, what progresses in the soft skills area? The, the biggest thing in the soft skills that we see um, over the four years in the program is, and it's, it's not exclusive to like, just because they're in our program, it's across, sure. across the sure. campus. But um, I, I can't help but think that the way we do our, our group project mm. contributes to like, interpersonal dynamics and communication and being able to communicate effectively and respectfully in a, in a small group setting where you are both contributing effectively, but not overrunning the whole conversation, mm-hmm. I think is a, is a really big one. Yeah. I, I think that one, that piece alone, when you're talking about working collaboratively with a team, which I know engineers always are working with multiple people, right? You have to be able to bounce ideas off each other. That communication piece is so important and to your point if we're working just on a worksheet we're not going to be able to develop that that set of skills and so in thinking about uh, play and experiential learning <clears throat> I think one of the things that is really unique about your program is you have the opportunity to make things so hands-on but to your point earlier we have teachers who are maybe teaching different subjects where it's a little bit more difficult. So what would your advice be to them? Let's say I'm teaching something that it's, it tends to be more siloed, right? It's not something that naturally leads into that playful experience. What would your advice be for educators who want to create a more experiential classroom? So I would, I would say that the thing to do is start with one, one idea for play, one idea for a game, however, however you want to phrase it. And that lesson is going to look obviously different for everybody. Yeah. Um, but take it, you know, think about learning experiences that you've had in your career or in mm-hmm. your professional life, um, especially because with CTE, we get so many people yeah. that come from industry and then come into teaching mm-hmm. and they bring absolutely invaluable experience with them in that. And so, you know, if you can think of an important lesson from industry that you're bringing with you or an important lesson that perhaps you sometimes struggle with student engagement on and then look at how you can turn that into play. Mm. Um, so I had a discussion with uh, one of our logistics CTE teachers in the district because he was, you know, kind of looking at how he could do things. Um, and it wasn't entirely my idea. It was just kind of a, a mutual conversation. Yeah. So I don't want to be like, this was my idea and it's great. <laughs> uh, 
But one of the things we talked about with him was, you know, looking at, so what if your students ran, ran like a simulated transport company mm. and you start with, you know, because all the, all the data is there. If you know where to look, I don't, but he does. Cause mm-hmm. that's what he did professionally before he came to teaching. Yeah. And so you could start them with, you know, okay, so you all start with five semi trucks and you've got to move material or you've got to make, make money. You know, you've got your five semi trucks and it costs you this much per day to have them. Mm-hmm. How are you, you going to make the profit? And then building from semi trucks to then going to, you know, commercial shipping to then going to commercial air freight. And then in a senior year project, now you've got all of those resources available and how, you know, what part of the market are you going to target? What part mm-hmm. of, you know, are you going to look at a geographical area? Or are you going to look at a type of cargo? Or are you going to look at a type of transportation and how all those pieces come together? Um, and I'm not sure exactly what he's done with it. I haven't had a chance to, to mm. touch back in with him, but that's one of those things where something that is, you know, really an, is a niche industry in the sense sure. of it's a very specific set of skills, even though it touches literally so many other else. things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So if I'm um, looking at your curriculum in the, in the classroom that you work in, you have all of these open-ended projects, all of these play-based learning experiences that you have integrated throughout the year. But you also mentioned that you do the certification program. So I'm curious how you've been able to kind of balance those and where those two kind of plug in together. Yeah, so the they absolutely plug into each other. Mm. Um, so for example, with the freshmen, we I start them with AutoCAD right out of the gate. And we initially... Like we do a a technical drawing every week. So like a piece Mm. out of a blueprint and the first several weeks, it started like the first one, I walked them through it step by step. Like it's up on the big screen and they see everything that's going. And then over the next several weeks, we kind of start taking the training wheels off. Yeah. Um, And then by this point in the year, they're doing multi-view drawing. So they're drawing three different views of the same object and dimensioning it and everything else. Um, So that kind of handles the, how part of how we get them ready for certification sure. because with any software the biggest thing is just being familiar enough with it that you're not afraid of the software yeah. yeah um and so we're able to incorporate because we start building those skills right from the beginning of the year we're able to incorporate that into our projects so mm-hmm. by second quarter when they're doing uh what we've typically done is an egg drop so mm-hmm. very specific list of like you can only use this materials it has mm-hmm. to fit these requirements but they're able to draw a basic blueprint of it in AutoCAD and use that as part of their documentation for their sort of digital engineering notebook on it. And then by third quarter, we're designing cardboard bridges. We've got one right here. And so we're able to have them uh, design cardboard bridges and they research bridges, they research how structures work, how trusses Mm -hmm. work. They design it in AutoCAD initially, and then they take it into West Point Bridge Designer, which is a free sort of physics simulation that shows where you have tension and compression in the bridge. So mm-hmm. then they can really understand what's happening in that truss system. Then they take mm-hmm. it back into AutoCAD and design it into something that we can send to the laser cutter and cut out. And it all goes together with, you probably can't see it, but it has little slots and tabs that all yeah. go together. So everything fits. It it assembles really fast. They're able to build them in just a a day or two of class time. Mm -hmm. And then we're able to test them till they break and see where they fail and what works, what doesn't, and kind of have a a discussion about that afterwards. So it works really Mm. well. And then testing, of course, for the certification, is that typically at the end of the year? Where do you plug that piece? So we put that at the end of third quarter. Um, mm. And we do that so that if students aren't able to pass on a first attempt, but are close enough that it looks like, you know, it might have might have been that it was a, a computer issue on our side or just yeah. wasn't a good day for them. It gives yeah. us enough time that we can have them retest before the end of the year. OK, I love that. Well, this has been so insightful. And I feel like you're such an expert in this area. I mean, starting out in kind of that museum industry where everything is hands-on and play-based, it it really has made you an expert in this space. So I just wanted to see any final thoughts that you wanted to share on this subject before we wrap up. Um, I mean, I think the the biggest thing is, and it, I don't know, I feel kind of cliche saying it, but like, (laughs) don't be afraid to try stuff. Yeah. Um, 
you know, uh, obviously you don't want to jump into this space new to this kind of this kind of thing and go, yep, we're going to do it all year for everything. Mm hmm. But it's very easy to go, okay, well, let's let's try a little something that's going to take two or three class days and see how that works, see how the students engage with it, see how I feel mm -hmm. teaching it. Um, it's like everything else. It's an ongoing learning process. And I, I think that's one of the valuable things about it, too, is even if it, something doesn't work the way you expect it to be, if you're honest with the students about it, I think that's really valuable for them because they can see that, like, it's not just you telling them, well, you, you've got to yeah. have a growth mindset. It's going, no, we, we've all like, we're all in this together. We're all yeah. going to try it. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to learn something from it either way. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to your point that you made previously, keeping a pulse on what they feel like works and what they feel like doesn't, right? It can help you adjust your curriculum as you go along and seeing how they engage with it, I think really makes a big impact. Absolutely. Well, I am so grateful that you got to come and talk with us a little bit more about this. You're just going to be my go-to for all things play and kind of project-based learning. So we're really excited that we got to spend some time talking about this again. Thanks for listening to another episode of our podcast. We're so happy to have you as part of our certified community. Make sure to follow and rate our podcast so that we can bring more educators into our wonderful and supportive group. We're also here to connect, so feel free to join us by visiting www.certified.certiport.com.